Bretonia, a land of fair ladies and fair lords, with even fairer peasants. As one of the Game 1 factions that has fallen into disrepair, despite getting a number of reworks throughout the many years since its inception. And in this video today, I want to talk about how Bretonio could be fixed without even needing a major DLC, but at the end of the video, we're going to talk about how Bretonia actually does need a DLC when compared to the polish of Game 3 factions. We'll mainly be going into the building browser, tech trees, and layering in some mechanics from, say, the Warriors of Chaos. And I'll be using some source images from old 5th edition Warhammer Army books, or, you know, kind of discussing the changes on a static screen. So I apologize for the low-tech display of certain things. You can quickly navigate to any part of the video that interests you the most by using the chapters in both the timeline and the description. As always, guys, if you end up enjoying the content, Content, please don't forget to like, comment, and or subscribe. Help me in completing the greatest grail quest of them all, the YouTube algorithm. But let's get started on fixing Bretonia. So here we are with a Loan campaign and uh, Loan Loanker, and we can see that a lot of things have changed in Bretonia over the years. We got a whole new tech tree with a lot of different things and how it works out. Um, we got these really cool uh, vows on the characters and how these all work themselves out here. In fact, let's actually take a look at a, a naked lord and look at all the vows. You can do the cool pledges and all these things. And these are some of the cooler things that were added into the game with the Reponse Leoness FLC that accompanied a a uh, major Bretonian old world update from Warhammer 2. I think this was during the Hunter and the Beast. I think that's the, the Nakai, the Wanderer, and the Empire one. I, I can't remember 100% which one that accompanied, but still. It added a lot of really cool changes to Bretonia and really made it um, a pretty fun faction for the time. But now that we're into Total War Warhammer 3, we're into the Immortal Empires, we have this big, huge, grand map to take advantage of. Bretonia feels a little lackluster, and in and, and ways even that the Empire can't compare to. Uh, so what we're going to talk about right now is going into each one of these uh, pockets that I think that you could just change with a patch. Now, uh, to make an argument up front, you could just simply use a mod that I'm sure changes all this. I've never used stuff like the Steel Faith or the Radius Overhaul mods. Everyone always says, uh, try those out. But I don't want to use a mod for something that I feel like the vanilla game should have as an improvement upon itself, right? Like, if this is this grand um, image of all the factions on one cool map, well, then some factions shouldn't be so much better than the others just by virtue of being a newer faction. They should all kind of be up to a certain snuff. And I should also kind of say, as a, another point of, like, discrepancy here, I also have a feeling that almost every single faction is going to get a newer old world update like a warhammer 3 old world update basically to kind of bring everyone up to a certain bar because now we've got all, all that whole development team is probably now helping all this stuff in some way or another and that's another final point before we jump into some improvements i want to see i'm not a developer i don't know what it takes to change any of the things that i'm going to talk about i might use uh, a generalization or i might oversimplify something so i apologize if you are a developer uh, of another game company or or you just in general you know coding and you're going that's not that easy bro um i'm just trying to say here are some things that i would like to see changed and i understand that it's not so simple as flipping a switch so i've got to make make those arguments up front here so let's take a first look at the building browser for Bretonia. So with the building browser for Bretonia, we see that it's it's really heavy loaded, right? It's it's really top loaded towards tier four and tier five buildings, almost to the point where you know, okay, if I'm in Corona here, that's one, two, three, four, five, six building slots of my ten, and that's I guess okay. But I think that you could change the building browser or the building slots and how this all kind of works out, and it would immediately alleviate a lot of not tension, but I guess a lot of issues I've personally had with the Bretonian campaign. Let's start over here in infrastructure. So in, with infrastructure, with Bretonia, you have a choice between industry or farming for income. Farming goes into the landed estate, which gives you 600 income, and it gives you access to your peasant bowmen with both pox arrows and fire arrows, as well as just your, your standard peasant mob, which Again, that's it's it's going to come up when we talk about the provincial capital, the capital building, um, and or you have a chance of industry, right? And industry just increases your income by four hundred. Now, each one of these between farming or industry has then a supporting building line. Water wheel for farming gives you income from farms increased by fifty percent. Growth plus five on all adjacent provinces. Growth plus ten and local recruitment capacity. 
or if you want to increase industry, you go with a storage. This increases the income from industry by 50%, campaign movement range plus 15% for own armies, attrition minus 10%, local recruitment capacity, ammunition plus 50% when under siege. Ah, I think you just get rid of industry. Get rid of industry, get rid of its supporting um, building line, and just take the storehouse campaign movement and ammunition because the rest of it's kind of booty. Like, I don't really care about attrition minus 10% when under siege. It's cool, but... Put that here into the reinforced walls. Okay, now it's at minus 10, 20 already because of the top one. Maybe make it 25 as a special Bretonia thing. Um, local recruitment capacity, that's already put into the water wheel, right? Um, campaign movement range plus 15% for own army starting this their turn in this region. That's so few of, of the times that you actually start in your region because I'm usually forging out from my border. That I just think that, like, by and large, there's, there's a mod for this, but it should just be implied in your actual faction. You move faster in your own territory because of paved roads or whatever. Make that a building, too. Paved roads. They, they have it for the Dark Elves. Um, but I think just get rid of the, the storehouse in the industry. I think it removes a lot of analysis paralysis, especially for new players that just don't understand how to, quote-unquote, min-max that. Uh, they may be going, well, I want the units, but what the hell, what, what, what do I do here? And, and by and large, too, you're looking at 400 plus an additional 50%, that's 600 um, industry income coming from this. So it's really not that much because this is going to give you an additional 300. That, that's going to be 900. You, you get more income from farming, and I just find it to be way more useful because you get access to uh, peasant better, better peasant bowmen. Now, going on to the note of that Tier 5 kind of um, bloat, why do I have a brothel here at Tier 5 giving me just 50 income, 5 control, then 4 control in adjacent provinces? This should be tier four at max, at max. If you want to make it two, three, four, that's done. But I think it just should be a one, two, three, typical control structured um, building line. And I guess more often than not, you get two, three, four, uh, like uh, tiers two, three, and four for your control buildings. But I think that this being a tier five building at 4K and giving me such a, min a minuscule amount doesn't make, doesn't incentivize me to want to put it in a provincial capital. At that point, I'm like, well, I'll just suffer the control penalties for the middling amount of bonuses I get from by building this and wasting a slot in Corone right here. Uh, no, no problems with the apothecary. It's growth and casualty replenishment. Totally fine with that. In fact, I like the two together. Uh, most, most factions actually don't have that. Now, the big thing though that I think could be changed. It's the military recruit and supportment kind of supportment military recruitment and support layout for Bretonia. <laughs> Change this right here. Make it so that all the damsels can be made in the tier two building, and make it so the tier three building has your foot squires and remove the royal barracks. What you see with a lot of factions that are more updated is you get access to casting way easier or way faster, especially in an army that really needs it. Uh, when you get access to the lore of life, you can now actually have a very stalwart or at least very um, uh, a longer lasting Bretonian line. Beasts and Heavens. Heavens, you're going to get access to that harmonic conversion. It's going to be really great for you. Beasts, you get your Weissens, Wild Form, your Pans and Penetral Belt, your Amber Spear. You just really need casting in this game, period. So being gated by a tier three Grail Chapel really kind of sucks because if you're not really up to making your provincial capital up to tier three quickly because you're going to want to make it in a provincial capital then it suffers because you're not getting access to those damsels in any kind of expediency in your campaign and that really is a pain in the dick so put those damsels into tier two make it accessible there and i think end it at tier three you don't really uh, cathedral of the lady is a really cool term but I don't think you really need this to be this tier five building connected to the chapel. Make it its own building in military support that combines the Hippogriff and the Royal Pegasus Knight. And the reason I'm saying that is because the Royal Pegasus Knight and the Royal Hippogriff Knight and the Grail Guardian are all Grail Knights. They all have the Grail Val. Put them all in the same building and reduce that bloat on that tier five because... When you have those tier five buildings, you're you're using that in case in, in, in the stead of something else. And I'm going to recommend removing all the tier five buildings as a point of like saying like, hey, here's how you could deal with that tier five building. Not as a we need no tier five buildings. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying 
the what I'm about to talk about of, of removing each one is saying, okay, if you want to keep that tier five building there, why don't you reduce this tier five building here? That's kind of what I'm angling at here by talking about each one of them having a different placement. So foot squires, place them in your tier three chapel with the grail relic and move all of your damsels into tier two. And the big thing, reason I'm putting that, that foot squire over there is that the foot squire is lumped in with the grail Val, more or less, when it comes to character bonuses. Skills usually give bonuses to the Foot Squires and then Grail Knights or whatever it is. It's usually kind of put together there in some way, shape, or form at least. And then remove that Royal Barracks so that you can make all of your military quote unquote recruitment stuff in a minor settlement. You can have all the way up to your men at arms with pole arms and you're done. You're good. You're set to go. And the same thing here with your stables. You're good all the way to tier four. You get access to Pegasus and Grail. Grail Knights, well, I guess you could put Grail Knights in your cathedral too. I, I guess I, I totally forgot about them because <laughs> um, I always go with the Grail Guardians. But still, I think Tier 4 is just fine there. But when you look at the Trebuchet, it's another thing that you really kind of need in the army. And I think just kind of changing that around where you make it so that um, uh, the Trebs are just ranks 3 and 4. So rather than having two and five, just put three and four if you so wish. And that way it's kind of like, okay, we've met, we've met in the middle. It does kind of make it so field trebuchets take longer so you could do two and four. But I think the big problem I have with stuff like this, the Royal Barracks, that's a tier two unit. Um, God damn it, the Siege Workshop, that's a tier two unit. Yes, you do get the bonus of construction cost reductions for all buildings, but it's only in the local province. So it's hard to really abuse this, right? You can't go ahead and make siege workshops in your minor settlements to really kind of like break the system or anything like that. So I think paying 10 grand for a tier two unit and a minus 10% construction cost for a six turn production, I'd rather just pay the extra 10% on this and make the abbey of the grail champions or pay the extra 10 percent on this and make the cathedral of the lady because it's taking six turns to make the damn thing so i think one of these reduces that as well right that's construction cost so i was like i think the armory does that as well so i think kind of just jimmying around the the military recruitment and military support infrastructure buildings makes it way easier to access bretonia and all of the uh, capital buildings, they don't produce units. Almost every single Warhammer 2 and now 3 faction has had it changed so that they get units produced in the provincial capital. So you do not need to make military buildings. So if they change that, you can make it so that the tier 3 building has the foot squires and these uh, men at arms and spear men at arms are just in the pro provincial capital. Or you take the peasant bowmen and the peasant mob and just put them in the provincial capital building or whatever settlement capital building that we've had now going forward where those now start to produce units. Those things alone, I think could just really streamline the process and make Bretonia a far stronger faction or at least a better faction that early game. Now for the technology tree of Bretonia, it's kind of a mess, but it also has some really cool aspects to it, right? Like each one of these heraldries giving you basically the ability to confederate that portion of Bretonia, thus then uniting Bretonia under one banner easily without having to kind of deal with the diplomatic relations. It's cool, but I mean, it kind of makes it so that when I start a Bretonian campaign with either Lo and Leonkar or as um, uh, the Fae Enchantress, I just press this button to start. And by, by turn 36 or 35, I mean, I guess you could say 35, I gonna I am going to have confederated what is left or all of Bretonia. And that's kind of cool. It's a great way to kind of unify the land. Uh, the empire certainly doesn't get that capability, right? But I think that it's almost maybe too easy. Maybe some of these need it and the others don't like okay, Artois and Peravon and and Leoness or or uh, Bastogne. Cool. Have those have those have the quick uh, technologies for them, but maybe stuff that um, like Carcassonne or Corone, maybe those don't have an actual um, uh, technology affixed to them. And I think that it's just kind of, it, it immediately puts your campaign on the rails for Bretonia. Because you start the game and you just press this button because you just, you want to unify the land so you have a super strong faction, right? You might as well do it. Then you get all these, which are pretty cool. It gives you bonuses towards the diplomatic relations of these factions. But again, they're really not that crucial. It's like, okay, if I'm playing as Corone, maybe I do want leaders of men diplomacy. But 
I'm also probably going to go to war with Marienburg. So you do have that capability. And then this is really the way that you're going to increase the capabilities of your campaign, right? This is what's going to give you income to your farms. This is going to further increase your income to farms. But I think what also sucks about this technology tree is there's too much gating according to cost. Improved trade vessels. So for 4K, I'm going to get 5% more trade income and then 5% tradable resources produced. Whereas every other faction would just get that for free as part of one of their technologies. I think remove a lot of the pay gate and just allow it to do what it wants. Allow you just to have those increases. What I think could be cool, what could be cool is almost kind of break this apart in the same way that you have for Kislev. Where Kislev says, hey, if you have one of these pivotal cities you then can access these technologies hey if you have one of these pivotal cities or you have done the confederation with carcassonne you can get access to all of these damsel and all of these prophetess and all of these uh casting buffs hey if you have done bestone here's going to give you a bunch of i don't know beast slaying stuff uh, i kind of threw it off the top of my head hey you've done paravone here's a bunch of royal pegasus knights and pegasus knights uh, bonuses oh you know you've done Borderloo, here's your trade stuff, here's your naval speed, here's your this and that. Like, make these kind of fun and characteristic or make them part of something. Like, hey, if you want the heraldry of Borderloo, you can get that research and then it's going to unlock a bunch of stuff for your income and trade. So that these are thematically locked or they're thematically driven. And what I mean by that is you get four technologies from the heraldry of borderloo then you get the heraldry of borderloo you know what i'm saying you get your naval speed increase you get your income from tradable resources i'm sorry income from trade and your tradable resources increases blah 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 blah, blah whatever four it is and now you can confederate borderloo or it's the other way around so i think that that could be a really cool way to make the technology tree feel more alive and not feel like you're picking and choosing all right, well, my campaign, I'm going to be dealing over here with the Ruinous Powers, so I'm going to go ahead and select that. Oh, you know what? I'm going to actually be playing as uh, Corone, or, yeah, Corone. Uh, so I want the Winter Decree because I'm going to go fight against Norska, which is all really cool, though. I actually do like the Decrees of Bretonia. I think these are actually really cool because it does kind of add a little bit of a, hey, this is how I'm playing my campaign. I'm going to go do it. So I do actually appreciate those. I just think that this whole section over here kind of feels too disjointed and too and not rewarding enough especially when it requires me to pay money into it so i'm not a huge fan of that and the same thing with the chevalier code i find that it will it ultimately becomes it makes your campaign very limiting because you just press this button when you start out so there are plenty of ways you could change the technology tree for bretonia this is really just one of the ones i had in mind i'm sure if i got cracked out on enough caffeine i could come up with a different one but i think the technology tree is another big thing that could just simply be moved around shifted changed altered a little bit with a patch or an old world update quote unquote and it would simply make bretonia run better and feel smoother and less like i said so many times before on the rails moving into some cool reddit action uh reddit poster kanaf k-a-n-a-p-h made a really cool diagram here because i was talking on my discord like yo what if you could take the warriors of chaos capability to upgrade units and put that into bretonia and someone said well hey someone already made a really cool picture of that on uh, reddit and here you go and basically this applies to knight a knightly virtue to a knight you can see that little replicated right here here's all the virtues and so for example here we're using heroism and he has heroism as uh bonus versus large plus five and that's just simply for a knight errant then the knight errant can progress to another realm giving it bonus versus large plus eight then a questing knight up to bonus versus large plus 10 with a grail knight at a plus 15 and i love that idea of making it a two-prong kind of uh, system very similar to the warriors of chaos right we're warriors of chaos hey yeah you know what you're gonna be a warrior of chaos and you're gonna choose a different mark well then here's the progression for that mark well hey here is the virtues of knighthood for bretonia you want to choose a virtue like um knightly temper and that's going to increase your melee attack well that's what you're going to have as your as your knightly temper and that maybe changes your heraldry of your of your armor and you can progress your character because that is a big thing that i think that the warriors of chaos dlc has unlocked for 
Total War Warhammer is this progression. And I think that progression is something that needs to be applied to more factions. Not so much in a Warriors of Chaos way, but just in a way to make it feel like, all right, I play the early game, I use my early game units, and, you know, barring some specific lore cases, right? Like uh, um, uh, High Elf Spearmen don't become White Lions of Trace after enough training. They just choose to be Spearmen because they're militia, and White Lions of Trace are not militia. Like, it, they're, they're regulars. So you can make the kind of argument about those kinds of things here and there. But I'm just saying stuff like watching a Norskin raider or, or, or norskin marauder go into a warrior of chaos which is how the lore portrayed them to be i think is amazing and i think the virtues of knighthood here that kanaf has made and also this progression from knights errant into the knight of the realm which is the way it's supposed to be the knight of the realm then gets a vision and he goes on a quest he becomes a questing knight and once he completes his quest he becomes a grail knight to have that as a part of progression for the uh for Bretonia would be amazing. And I'm sure there's going to be a mod that replicates this. But just simply taking that process of progression, slapping it onto Bretonia would be amazing. Now, we're starting to get into some DLC uh, uh, territory. And we're going to start segueing now with the next thing I want to talk about. Because it's like one part DLC, one part FLC type stuff. So let's now go back into the game to talk about chivalry. So the chivalry meter up here is, is nifty. It gives me leadership, and then I can call the Green Knight, and I get recruitment rank for my knights, all the way up to this. So you can call the Green Knight limitless times. All lords start with the questing vow, which is cool enough. All units gain uh, per turn plus 100 experience. Lord recruitment rank plus 5, corruption minus 2, recruitment rank plus 4, returning knights, and leadership. Also, it's part of your objectives. If you do not have enough uh, for the long campaign victory, if you do not have enough chivalry, you cannot complete. Same thing here. Oh, well, fuck my ass. Never mind. Um, <laughs> I went ahead and said that. So what I think would actually be very cool, and this is going to, it's going to segue us into our, our, our DLC conversation, is changing chivalry to be a two-pronged scale. Have it be chivalry or anti-chivalry. Chivalry gives you maybe stuff like b barrier, and that, that was one of the things that uh, Knopf had in that progression. The virtue of purity gives you barrier, which I thought was a really cool idea. Maybe going down the Shivara code grants you defense, like it gives you armor or, or uh, unbreakable or um, barrier or ward saves or physical resistance or spell resistance. Again, you are you are a knight of Bretonia. You are shielding the people. You are that, that bastion against evil or chaos or the beasts and the undead and whatever it is, right? And that's the kind of role of chivalry. And that gets you access to grail knights and grail guardians and royal grail, blah, 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 blah. All the kind of cool things that you would get. Or you go into anti-chivalry. And I'm calling it anti-chivalry because I'm stupid and don't have a cool name for it other than that. Other than that. And this focuses on aggression, melee attack, weapon strength bonuses. It gives you access to different units. There, which I said this during a stream and someone's like, yo, there's a, there's a mod for this. But like a Bretonian brigand that maybe uses two maces and has anti-infantry and AP. And it's, it's a good kind of like replacement for the foot squire, right? Less of a less of a uh, an offense or I'm sorry a defensive character and more of an offensive character. Even though you know the foot squire <laughs> is very much offensive. It's a great sword infantry. It's not like he's got a shield here, but still, and you, uh, maybe not even a replacement for the foot squire. It could just be a, a low tier infantry unit that you could use. Maybe uh, a Bretonian highwayman that uses a uh, crossbow or a uh, crossbow on horseback, right? Like a handheld crossbow. Having a little bit more fun with that, like using like Fallen Knights, something like that, where you take this more of a Malbod or, 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 or an evil kind of character for uh, for Bretonia, and you're pushing against that normal route that you would take otherwise. Almost kind of like what we had for Total War Medieval 2, where you had a Dread and you had Chivalry. And if you were Chivalrous, you had all these bonuses, but if you had Dread, you had different bonuses. And I think that could be a cool-ass way to play Bretonia, which now segues me into a dlc for bretonia enter beaumont the beast slayer the duke of bastone and i think this could be a really cool character and another two characters i had in mind and i've already talked about malbot and how malbot could be a really amazing character or just give the red duke an actual faction an actual like kind of anti-chivalry faction and i think what's kind of fun with these options is that 
Bretonnia has a crap ton of lords to choose from. This is the fifth edition uh, Warhammer army book for Bretonnia. This is the very the very first army book I ever purchased is this one right here. So it has a special place in my heart. But um, I think what could be cool here for Beaumont is that it's not too far of a departure in this in the way that the Red Duke would be almost like a Bretonian undead hybrid faction and Malabod, who is a you know a fallen knight a dark knight a, a black knight a black knight i think he is um could be a, a super far uh, a departure as well but Beaumont is this beast slayer, right he's the duke of bastone and he's known for pretty much leaving his dukedom to shitty administrators that he replaces all the time which could be part of a campaign mechanic you could have two administrators one for military and one for um infrastructure and maybe one you can replace or maybe it's just like a, a council like you've had for a lot of other factions like the vampire coast and what have you and you're replacing lords into those slots whatever it is but i think that could be a, a, a faction or i'm sorry a, a faction mechanic in and of itself but for the character he's really cool he's kind of this not necessarily i, I use the word anti too much in this goddamn video but i'm still saying like He's a different duke. He he doesn't stay in Bastogne. He goes and does whatever he wants because he's trying to go slay beasts. His mace is made of the thigh bone of a dragon. That's sick. And I think that could be a cool kind of role for this character. An anti-large character that focuses on beast slaying. Maybe he has a mechanic very similar to uh, uh, Norska where he's kind of out hunting beasts and you could place him in the Darklands as maybe a Bastogne Heraldry or, or Bowman's Beast Slayers or whatever it is. Give him access to the Regiment of Renown that shares his name. And you have a character that is different and far out. And you could even tap into the Bretonian Navy, which would then take access to gunpowder units. Getting those units exclusively to this faction as some sort of whatever, right? As this far-ranging faction, it kind of has a little bit more fun and kind of character to it. Looking even at the magic items for the character, he's got the Beast Mace of Baston, Bowman's Shield, um, his cloak is uh, the, the cloak of Gilles Le Breton because he, he derives his... Um, not heraldry. Uh, he has a link back to Gilles Breton, right? The, the the creator, the Arthurian character of Bretonia, and the Beast Mace is kind of cool because it brings in another thing that I want to talk about—a new contact effect that wouldn't be unique to Bretonia, but it's one I think that Total War could use in a lot of ways. Um, and I think there's one similar to it with the Skaven, but a bleeding contact effect. So the Beast Mace adds plus two to Bowman's strength, and each wound inflicted equals not one wound upon the enemy models but d3 wound so it'd be cool if there was a contact effect bleeding for special barbed arrows or for the beast mace of bastone here or our certain situations that would maybe reduce melee attack and speed um because you know all they're bleeding out or whatever it is or maybe it's a slow drain on their health over time or vigor over time something like that um and it takes like 20 seconds or 30 seconds to dissipate just like poison does but it's just a different way to kind of put a contact effect on things for bretonia which doesn't have access to any kind of cool crazy contact effects aside from just poison from the pox arrows and then magic and flaming attacks then Bowman shield here is a really cool one that just pretty much you know it's a shield that's just cool things on it on roll on a roll of six the enemy weapon is snapped in two parried by the shield and destroyed resolve enemy hits that are not parried by the shield in the normal way but once the weapon is broken all further hits from the weapon are ignored i mean we obviously can't do that this is usually displayed as an increase to cooldown. that's usually how items like this are kind of brought into the game so i think that those kind of those kind of things for this character are already kind of present right and and his cloak the dragon cloak of smirgus because that's his heraldry is this cool dragon that dragon is the the dragon smirgus the one that gilles breton destroyed and killed so having this character kind of be a far-ranging different character could be a lot of fun and a great way to put bretonia into the dark lands and that's where i think you could place them in the mountains of morn because i don't think that bretonians have a have any Characters that allow them to be placed in the mountains and placing them right in the mountains more could be a lot of fun. I mean, you could put them in pig barter, but that could be kind of wild, right? You've got Imric to your west, you've got Greases to your northeast, you've got Gorse to your southeast, you have the eventual placement of your uh, Chaos Dwarfs to the northwest. It could be a lot of fun. But even for moving further down, 
the Green Knight. Oh, God, this is one of the... I remember seeing this as a kid and just being like, this is the coolest fucking character in the game. Um, Morg uh, Morgiana Le Fay. Morgiana Le Fay. Which I'm surprised it doesn't isn't in the game. But you have the favors, which could be a really cool thing to, to add into the game as well. Because you've got the traits, and those traits are usually the virtue of, the, of Joust and so on and so forth. You've got the vows, and you can have the pledges attached to those vows. But I think it would be really cool, though, is adding favors as a single skill that gets locked out for each Bretonian lord and legendary lord. And those skills, you know, uh, you usually see these for maybe, say, the Vampire Coast or um, Lizard Men, where there's where there are blessings, right? Blessings from this specific god, where you choose that and locks the rest out. And give the favors just like that. Favor uh, demon slaying, and maybe this just and, and just to kind of go through them really quick to, on a, on a on a very like base level. Okay, D, a demon slaying gives the Lord magical attacks plus melee attack when fighting against chaos demons or maybe the whole army uh dragon slaying plus bonus versus large and fire resistance maybe and these are just again i'm just throwing them off the top of my head uh banishing that could give you something like winds of magic or something like that i i, I don't know i hadn't really thought about banishing but wizard slaying could give enemy miscast chance increased winds of magic power reserve spell resistance stuff like that uh fortune could give you ward save leadership and or speed um Justice here could give you spell and physical resistance. Bravery could be an increase your weapon strength and melee attack. Just a really cool way to give a little bit of a bonus to the character that is, again, very thematic to things that have already existed in uh, Bretonia. And the reason I'm pulling this from the 5th edition book is because we had the same thing happen with the Wood Elves. So I think it was either the 5th or the 6th edition book where they pulled the spites from and all those cool little, uh, uh, which became traits for the Trent's um ents trends what do they call in this game i can't even remember anymore the tree men jesus um where you get those really cool bonuses to them so i think that there are so many untapped things especially in the earlier editions of stuff right like um if i were to go all the way back up here that's the old lance formation which they changed in uh i think actually in sixth or seventh edition if i go all the way back up here to the army list Look at all of these special characters. Each one of them could be a legendary lord in their own right. Bertrand the Brigand, uh, they've got a, uh, I don't remember if this book actually has them in here, but there is a, maybe it actually is Bertrand the, Bigrand, the, the, the Brigand, um, the Brigand, but a, a Robin Hood character. And I think that Bretonia is one of those factions that is rife to have heroic heroes right the the legendary heroes that i've talked so much about that i think that we need more of in the in the game and i think that having these characters placed in these locations um could be a lot of fun let's let's jump back into the game really quick to show off where that darkland start could look like so this is my imric campaign and it's probably the one i have just got the most visibility on these lo locations right so if imric starts over here at the fortress of vorag um is he started the, yeah he does he does um, because then Darkhold right there. I think putting like a Bowman over in this location could be really fun. Again, Pig Barter is pretty hot and wild. Maybe put him at Ruin's End, um, and that's how he how he gets there. Pig Barter is was uh, lore wise speaking a neutral kind of empire. I say empire because it's like it's like a generic human trading outpost. Um, or actually, I would have imagined a Kislev Lord starting here uh, in one of my videos, but. I think pretty much anywhere along this mountain range you could put Beaumont, and I think that those would be locations that can make this a very fun, cool place for Bretonia to take advantage of. Because I think when you look at look at the roster for Bretonia, it's another thing that kind of really suffers. Where if I take a take all that stuff out, this is a really kind of bare bones roster. And adding in stuff like those uh, Bretonian brigands, like those um, Bretonian highwaymen, different ways to, by the way, here's the Beast Slayers of Baston, the guys that would kind of be the auto regiment of renown on turn one, just like Sigvald has, right? Um, but giving access to different variety of units that could maybe jump into a more negative or, or more anti-chivalry route for Bretonia, I think is ultimately a really cool way to go because it's an untapped way because we've had so much interaction between Bretonia having civil wars with Malbod and trying to squash out Malbod while dealing with a rise in these black knights, these dark knights that have kind of broken the chivalric code 
and they exist out in the world. And the lore is, has spoken about these about these individuals and how they've become mercenaries. And Malbod brings them back into Bretonia. Um, eventually, he converts them into vampires, but that's neither here nor there. And that could be a really fun thing, like loyalty versus disloyalty to the Chivalra Code and how that affects Bretonian units and what that ultimately does to them. Um, if you want to go crazy about it, you could have like a fable or black and white kind of morality system where if you go really anti-chivalry, all your units looking like ragtag and beat up and, and dirty, where if they're chivalric, they have like auras of light on them and stuff like that. But again, a lot of this is a bit of a rant talking about things that I think... Um, Maybe we don't 100% need. And go ahead and let me know in the comment section below. Do you think that crossbowmen in, a, in an anti-chivalry thing is completely stupid for Bretonia? I'm totally open to that. I just kind of throwing a lot of ideas out here because Bretonia does need some love. It is in a really weird state, even more so than a lot of the other Game 1 factions that have since had major DLCs or updates to them. Rapunzel is the closest, closest thing that we've gotten to um, an actual content drop for Bretonia, and it is still a very fun faction that i think could just really use a little tweaks without a dlc but with a dlc it could really be a, an amazing faction that just blasts onto the warhammer 3 immortal empire scene in a really big way but as always guys thank you so much for watching here today let me know how you would change bretonia would you change something else differently about the technology or the building browser whatever it is let it be known in the comment section below but thank you so much for watching here today have a good one and take care